Gather round, friends. This is Uncle Dave, executive editor of ClassicsToday.com, here with the story of the classical music record industry. Now, you know, people like me, and many of you too, I know, who are serious collectors and you've been doing this forever, you all know this story. You know who the players are. You know who the labels are. You know that the psychotic farrago of nonsense, which is the classical record industry, which has been amusing and entertaining us for decades, you know what it is. But somebody wrote to me recently, one of the commentators, and said, would you consider doing a video about the record labels, who these people are and what they are and what they do? And I thought to myself, well, we're taking for granted the fact that everybody just knows that. And I realized, first of all, there are a lot of people who are new to classical music who may not know it. And second of all, there are a lot of people who know classical music but still don't know it because why should they pay attention to it? It's insane. So I'm going to give you Dave's version of the history of the classical record industry from roughly the second half of the 20th century. But before we get there, we have to begin at the beginning. Let's start with the Big Bang. The universe was created about 13.8 billion years ago in a giant Big Bang thing that created all of the matter and time and stuff and energy that fills our universe. Now, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe finally became transparent enough. It had cooled sufficiently from the super hot soup of particles, the primal plasma, that the cosmic microwave background radiation was finally created. And we can still detect it right now. It's a couple of degrees above absolute zero, but those photons are still whizzing around. Now, fast forward to 1950, and we are, here we are with the classical music record industry. <sighs> For there's a lot of jargon associated with the classical record industry. Let me put it to you that way. Generally speaking, there are two huge categories of classical record labels, and these are historical labels. They have nothing to do with, objectively with quality or even quantity anymore. They really don't, but they are the majors and the indies, the major labels and the independent labels. Now, let's start with the major labels. The major labels originally were a group of five or six really big labels who had all of the major artists signed to them contractually. They were RCA, Columbia, Decca, Philips, Deutsche Grammophon, EMI, and uh, let's see, is there anybody else I'm not, I'm not remembering? Well, if I come up with something, we'll get to it. But that basically summarizes it. The situation now is a little different. There are fewer because they have all merged and remerged and demerged and co-merged, and they form these enormous corporate entertainment conglomerates. They are huge, absolutely huge. Universal Music is one of the three biggies of the remaining majors. Universal consists of, or consisted no longer, of three of what used to be majors. DECA, which was run out of, first of all, Switzerland and then London. Deutsche Grammophon, the famous yellow label, and Philips. Now, Philips has since been swallowed up by DECA. So all of the things that were on the Philips label, which was based in Holland, are now part of DECA. And so there are only two major labels in the major, major label group that is Universal Music. That's classical, of course. Universal is e immense, you know, in, in, in all fields of entertainment, not just recordings. But there is Deutsche Grammophon and there is DECA. And they each have sub-labels. For example, Deutsche Grammophon has Archive, which handles early music and Baroque music. DECA had a whole slew of them. DECA had 
Argo and Loazo Lear and their and their budget labels, associated budget labels. And there was also Mercury Living Presence. And now they have Westminster. And so it goes on and on and on. That is universal. That's one of the majors. The other major big merger conglomerate, that two of the third of the thir three of them is Sony BMG. Now, Sony BMG is a little bit crisper and cleaner because it is the remnant of what used to be Columbia on the one hand and RCA on the other. Columbia was acquired by Sony Music. RCA was acquired by the German Bertelsmann Company. That's BMG, Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann's Music Group. And then they merged with each other, making Sony BMG. This is actually has realized certain synergies because in the American market, at least, all of the American orchestras, the American artists were assigned either to RCA or Columbia for the most part. And some of them switched between them, for example, Eugene Normandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra. So when Sony and BMG merged, it became possible to reunite the artistry of certain certain uh, performers in like big box sets that have all the Sony and RCA recordings. That's quite handy. So Sony BMG is the other big major that's left. And the third is Warner Music. Now, Warner it was actually not much of a classical label. Warner used to be called Electra Asylum Nonsuch. And Warner's big label, classical label, was Nonsuch, which was a wonderful, enterprising label that did all kinds of unusual repertoire, original recordings and licensing stuff. That whole catalog has basically disappeared. I mean, bits of it are floating around, but it's totally exploited in, in, in a very very cursory way by Warner Music. I don't think they quite know what to do with it. However, Warner swallowed up EMI. And EMI, which is based in England, was enormous. It was a, it's one of the huge, many tentacled critters. You know, they had the Beatles. They had all these really famous rock groups. And they had a wonderful, wonderful classical catalog. The EMI catalog was known as Angel Records in the United States. And so we used to call it sometimes EMI Angel. It was known that way. And that also consists of a whole conglomeration of smaller sublabels and things that, that all pop together. And when you see stuff on Warner Music, some of those sublabels are still being used. For example, Irato, which was the French version of Warner. And so they have they have a whole collection of stuff too, but it's all under the rubric of Warner Music. Now, those are your three major labels. Put that aside. In the rest of the classical music world, there are the independent labels. Independent labels were smaller outfits who started to record artists that initially that couldn't make it to the majors. But as things got more demented in the 80s, particularly in the 70s and 80s, it became very, very clear that there were way too many artists. And some of them were fabulous. And they weren't going to have big careers unless they made recordings. And so independent labels took care of that perceived need. Some of the major independent labels, and, and you know who they are. You've heard about them. One of the big ones was Harmonia Mundi. Harmonia Mundi was kind of like, well, it was started by Bernard Coutaz, this French guy who handled his label rather in the same way that Charles de Gaulle ran France after World War II, you know, keeping France out of NATO, developing its own nuclear weapons. Bernard Coutaz had that kind of a mentality. And so Harmonia Mundi became its own, essentially, it's a major label. I mean, it made huge amounts of recordings focusing on early music, Baroque music, with a wonderful roster of, of artists and, and specializing also in period instrument performances. They were absolutely fabulous. They are fabulous. And Harmonia Mundi also set up its own distribution. And as a distributor, Harmonia Mundi brought under its roof a whole bunch of other independent labels, very fine independent labels, including, for example, Hyperion being one of the major ones, now Onyx, Channel Classics, and several others like that. 
Harmonia Mundi was sold to another media conglomerate called Pius, P-I-A-S, Pius, Pius. Sometimes it has brackets around it. I have no idea why. It's it's its logo. But P-I-A-S now owns Harmonia Mundi and still runs the distribution that contains all of those other labels. So that's that. And they also distribute some early music labels. I think Cor- they have Coro, um, which is the 16s label and things like that. A lovely, lovely boutique selection of independent labels. So that's Harmonia Mundi. On the other side of the independent label world, we have Naxos. Now, Naxos really is a major label. It's a major force, even if it's not considered a major label. Naxos began life in the most lovely way when Naxos's founder, Klaus Heymann, wanted to record his wife, who was a distinguished violinist, and, and Suzuki pupil, Takako Nishizaki. And from this, Mr. Heyman decided he could begin a classical label, exploiting mostly Eastern European artists on a completely different economic basis. Rather than, than having artists who were signed to the label and who got paid royalties and whatnot, he was going to make one-off recordings, that is fee-for-service recordings. He would pay the artist, he would own the recordings outright, he would sell them at budget price, and this was a wildly successful, successful gambit. Why? Because there are a lot of really fine artists out there who were not appearing on major labels. Tons and tons and tons and tons of them. The conservatories of the world have been churning out musicians. They want to get recorded. Some of them even have their own sources of financing, will pay for the privilege. That's become the standard economic model now. Unless you're one of the incredible major artists working for a major label, most recordings are now self-financed. They are paid for by the artists, and the label merely acts as a distribution mechanism for the recording that the artists have done independently. That's today's economic model for recordings. And that's why you don't see advertising. You don't see promotion of labels, particularly because that's not really what they're doing. They're simply distributing the stuff the artists pay them to do. But that's a whole nother situation as well. Naxos amassed and is continuing to amass an enormous catalog of just about everything in the universe often in performances which are every bit as good as anything else out there by anybody else. The quality of the performances is as high as it gets in this industry right now. The range of repertoire is broader than just about anything anyone else is doing. It's really it's really quite extraordinary. So Naxos founded its own distribution and brought a huge number of other independent labels under its wing, as did Harmonia Mundi. These include these include a lot of the German labels, for example, CPO, which special, special ugh, which specializes in unusual orchestral and and Baroque music, early music and, and contemporary listenable music and unknown composers, that kind of stuff. Also Hensler and Audita and and you know other German labels of that type. There are wonderful American labels like CD, um, and also Naxos owns shares of a bunch of labels. Naxos now owns the Vox catalog. They own Orfeo. They have controlling interests or some sort of relationship with Ondine, also with Denmark's Da Capo. It's really it's really extraordinary, and there are still dozens of other labels out there. And Naxos distributes a lot of them. Naxos distributes BIS, one of the most enterprising and remarkable labels that has ever existed, that was founded and is still basically under the aegis of Robert von Barr from Sweden. There's Jim Ginsberg's label, CD, right out of Chicago, an enterprising American label featuring artists from that neck of the woods. It's really amazing how much stuff there is out there. There are smaller distributors. There's Albany Music, which features Albany Records, and also another boutique selection of of smaller independent labels. So there really is, is an unbelievable range of people out there. But essentially, it all falls under the 
overall arching concept of major labels and independent labels. The advantage that major labels still have is that they have the distribution, mostly because they're pop music producers. And so they have they have international distribution of everything. They don't always treat classical music very well. And their new productions are usually not very, not as good as what the independents are doing. I'm telling you, the major labels, and even the artists on them, do not get to exploit their careers in the way that independent labels allow them to do it. But because the major labels traditionally had more money and more financing and have the prestige, the history, because they have enormous back catalogs, they also have a huge, uh, a huge cachet for some of these artists. But the stuff that they're turning out is really, really very, very shabby and spotty in quality, I think, even though they're supposedly homes to some of the major artists of today. I'm not impressed by anything the major labels are doing. I'm really not, except for big box reissues, which I talk about frequently. Finally, so we have the majors, we have the indies, and then there is another category, one last category in the classical music universe that we need to talk about. And that category is what you might call the self-producers. The self-producers come in two varieties. These are orchestras and performing arts organizations, and even artists who have their own label. For example, Gil Shaham has Canary Classics. The London Symphony has its own label. Chicago Symphony has its own label. San Francisco has its own label. A lot of orchestras are doing their own stuff, and this also includes the great European broadcasting companies, the state-run broadcasting companies like the BBC, and especially in Germany, because in Germany you had you had all the funks, you know, the Sudwest Funk and Mittel Mittel Deutsch Funk and and the the and NDR North German Radio North German Funk I don't know whatever it's called. Funk means spark, by the way. It also means radio. You know, Freude, Schöne, Goethe, Funken. That's the Funken. The spark is the Funken. So anyway, Rundfunk is, is a, a, a radio thing in German. I mean, you people all know that, but for those who don't know. Now, these German huge, huge state enterprises, they all live on things like TV taxes and royalties. I mean, I mean, the German radio radio people even have their own police force, you know, to to, to enforce their TV taxes and things. They're, they're, they're insane. And they have been recording, they have their own orchestras, and they are a source of employment for millions of musicians and conductors. And they've been recording stuff since since Radio has existed under the aegis of the state, and they've been told by the state, we're cutting your budget, go make a living. And so they have opened vast libraries of material, which is all being exploited. Sudwestfunk SWR is one of the biggest and actually one of the best and the most interesting. They were originally associated with Hensler, but now they're separate. And they, they all have this opportunity. Sometimes they make they make partnerships with major labels. Sometimes they have their own labels. It, it depends. It's a very fluid situation. And along with these self-producing orchestras and artists, that's a whole third wave of classical music sourcing, source material for recordings. So that, in a nutshell, is the classical music industry. It is a trilogy. The majors, the indies, and the self-producers, those are the people who you're going to run into. Those are the names that you will encounter of the labels. And I really hope that this tiny little explanation, well, didn't produce more confusion than it alleviated, because you'd never really know. We can go into detail about each individual component that I've just mentioned and subcomponent because there's just so much activity. But I think that explains something about why there's just so much stuff out there and so much stuff keeps coming because all of the money in the classical music business now, especially in records, is in production. It's in making the record. There is no money in marketing or sales or promotion because nobody expects to sell very many of them.
But artists want them. They want them to have as calling cards. They want to have their, their work documented. And there's money to do that. And so this stuff somehow keeps coming. And it really doesn't matter anymore under what label or rubric it's getting sold. There is no assumption of superior quality from any one component that I've just mentioned. You have to keep on listening. And that's why I'm here. And that's why we're all here together. That's what we're going to do. So thank you so much, my friends. Take care.